Life Raft Diagnostic 002. Hyperdrive 45%. Oxygen 47%. Digital AI power 88%. My mood reflective. Bitter. Nearing the anniversary of my 17th year on board, I had reached my expendability limit. This was unknown to me, as it generally is to anyone. There's no gauge, no sensor, no alarm. Of course, if you can't follow orders, or if you spend your days dreaming about kindling your own hyperdrive, your limit is imminent. But when you do the job, when your commitment to the cause is unwavering, criteria for reaching your limit can and will vary. The fortunate ones make it long enough to ultimately hang up their jumpers and take the great journey, never to return to station life. Most cease all external transmissions once they join the colony. Veteran crew can be traded across stations for nearly the entirety of their service, both voluntarily and involuntarily. Other crew members may have the skill sets and experience to join smaller crews, perhaps a chance to earn their wings and sit behind the console of an independent vessel. Some of us have heard stories of a station pilot who risked her livelihood to kindle her own hyperdrive from the embers of a decommissioned raft. With time, with delicate handling, with attention to detail and a small but competent crew of veterans, she was able to breathe life into a sun the size of her hand, fueling it relentlessly until it could return the favor tenfold having grown large and powerful enough to stake a legitimate claim in the perpetual race. Allegedly, this freelance cruiser is out there somewhere, racing still, creeping up on the strides of the great stations, weaving its way through the clutter. Or so the story goes. But for many, Expendability is like unstable ore, withstanding outside pressure for eons, only to explode from a gentle breeze upon extraction. An unexpected change in the station's course, a cosmos-wide slowdown from a star field or asteroid belt, or the rising expense of keeping a nuclear furnace blazing 24-7 is all it can take for mission control to expend in mass. In those difficult times, with rations made sparse and station power placed on backup in order to ensure the hyperdrive's longevity, thinning out the crew becomes essential. I should know. I've carried out the orders on many occasions. In thinking back, that morning was rather dull. Typical given the slower burn through a Category 4 star field that would take months to clear. The race itself progressed in a kind of slow motion these days, relative to our top speeds of inconceivable velocity. First orders sent me to the Northern Raft Dispatch. A nav board fix required authorization from a veteran pilot. Unexpectedly, the order came directly from Commander Eldridge, my commanding officer, which is not unheard of, but given the low-level nature of the order, there was likely something else at play. Micromanagement from the Commander Corps was at an all-time high, the screws of mission control tightening in anticipation of making up for lost time once we had cleared the star field. For the last two years I've been reporting to Eldridge, 
an enemy turned ranking officer after our station's uncontested triumph over his shamed vessel. After a rocky start, my peers and I eventually found a way to warm up to him, despite his unwillingness to return the favor. So, when I met him at raft dispatch that morning, as expected, he was all business. A navboard reprogram was implemented from Life Raft 0107, since that was the conduit halfway through the raft connection line. The board was located about two steps inside the raft itself, to the right of the transponder. Eldridge stood just outside the hatchway, reciting protocols and initiating the pre-check before I even had a chance to log my arrival. He seemed anxious. As I brushed past him, crossing the hatchway's threshold, I immediately felt a tingling up the back of my neck. As if in that split second, my mind had already seen the future. Time slowed, and as my right foot lunged forward to complete my first full step into the raft, my head began to turn around, as if on autopilot bringing Eldridge into my field of vision just in time to see him drop his clipboard and lunge for the emergency release. In less than a half second, the raft hatch slammed down behind me and a blinding flash of light instantly engulfed the pod's interior. As a sonic boom ruptured my eardrums, I remember a brief moment of weightlessness. Then, the searing sensation of my skull smashing against the bulkhead as my body went limp. No warning. No preparation. No helmet. No seatbelt. A vulnerable sack of flesh bouncing around inside an escape pod as it rapidly and violently fell away from the safety of its mother. I would never see my commander again. I would never step foot inside the station again. In one single and abrupt moment, life as I knew it had ended. And when I finally regained consciousness several days later, Lost in space, head pounding and ears still ringing. Somewhere beneath the sting of betrayal, I felt both lost and free at the same time. This is my chronicle for anyone out there receiving this transmission. <laughs>